Happy Sabbath. Uh, hey, uh, do you mind if I make one request? Well, I can't promise it'll only be one request, but my first request. Can you guys come closer to me? I, I like, I want to feel your warmth. I want to, I want to kind of see you guys clustered here towards the front. Uh, the, the, the first bench is where the million dollar prize is. Uh, I want to thank you again for the invitation to come and speak with you today. It's been my experience that when preparing to speak or speaking, that the sermons are as helpful to me, the speaker, as it is to those who I speak to. Because we're all in the same boat, really. We all struggle with the same things. And we all have to go through different trials, the human experience. And every word of, of an inspiration given by God is for each and every one of us, no matter in what stage of life you find yourself in. Whether you're in elementary school or preschool or college or you're done studying and now you're working and you're, you're working on honing in your skills as a professional in whatever field that you chose or that you're in. God's word will serve to uplift you and to encourage you through your day. So I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, let's bow our heads and invite the Lord to be with us and to speak through me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you again for the privilege of speaking to your people. Lord, as we sit and listen actively, Lord, we ask you to whisper in our ears. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts, to help us to understand the gifts that you have in store for us, the blessing that you have in store for us, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to as we are listening, to figure out how we can apply this in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Now, when I, when I was a younger man, uh, I used to get these magazines. Maybe you, you've heard of them, called Men's Health. You guys know what a Men's Health magazine, what it is and how it looks? I, obviously, I never really used them, but... Um, it was always my hope to kind of like be like those people on the covers, right? And, they, and, and it, it always goes the same. They, they have the person with the chiseled features on the, on the very cover, and, and they have all the titles like learn how to get a six-pack abs in, you know, two months or six weeks, and, you know, how to eat right, how to lower cholesterol, you know, how to get the girl of your dreams or whatever, whatever the, the, the titles are for that, for that, for that month. Actually, now that I got it, I've got, I got it for a full year, and it was always about abs, about getting the woman, and uh, maybe some diet tips. It was pretty repetitive. Just the covers changed. But always, you had the, the, the celebrity, right, or the athlete who was on the cover, who was showing their chiseled features and, and, and hoping galvanizing you to change or inspiring you to make that choice to, you know, quit those uh, midnight runs to McDonald's or to go to the gym more often or to replace every, every um, serving of soda with water instead, you know, wh whatever the choice is for that that you're struggling with, it, it serves to provide you with like inspiration to do something different, to change something, anything in your life that would put you on the path to where you want to be, to where you, who you want to be and how you want to look. And no matter what the story is, right, the, there, there's always a highlight. There's always, 
you've, you learn a little bit more about the person on the cover, and you start to read their story. Like, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Anybody know who that is? All right, I, I remember watching him on WWE when it used to be WWF, and, it, and he used to be just called The Rock, and he had a funny, funny accent. He acted kind of like Elvis, and he would do the people's elbow, and they, all be, before, you know, he became this big uh, acting blockbuster, you know, person. It's great personality. But you would look at him, and you would say, man, I, I can be like that. I could be that big. I could be that buff. I could be that cut. And then you start to read the story and you start to see what he does on a daily basis. And you're like, I can't do that. <laughs> so he's eating like six meals a day and most of it is like grilled, uh, gr- grilled fish or codfish. And I know all the Spanish people in, in the crowd are like, oh, bacalito. No, it's not the same as bacalao or fried because it's not fried and it's not breaded. It is just grilled you know, codfish to get that protein, you know, with greens and lean rice and brown rice and six times a day. And then going to the gym maybe four times a day, working on a different part of your body for like months, months and months just to look good for the cameras. And the moment that you stop eating those meals and the moment that you stop going to the gym that many times, the muscles begin to shrink. And what you worked so hard to amass starts to fade away. Unfortunately, because of sin, our bodies don't maintain the way they, that God designed them to maintain. They don't stay cut and lean or, you know, strong. Everything moves in, di- in different directions. If you're not working towards a goal or if you're not working on yourself or building or going to the, to the gym and eating right, then your body will either shrink because of what you're not doing or get stronger because of the choices that you're making. And it goes further than that. Even our minds are not what they could be. There's an interesting quote I have here. If you ask, many of you are doing finals right now, right? In college. School is almost done. Those final exams, the the final projects, the papers that need to be put in. But let me tell you something right now, okay? Keep studying. Because the moment that you stop studying, if you ask any teacher that's had to deal with any, any grade level from, from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, after a summer of just melting away in front of your favorite TV programs or your favorite video game or just being out on your bike or going to the, playing basketball in the, in, the, in the courts, if you're away from those books, if those books are not being read on a daily basis, if you're not looking over that material on a daily basis, guess what? (laughs) All that work that you put in to amass that information so that you can write the papers and pass the exams will start to fade away. By the summer after seventh grade, Students lose, on average, of 36% of their school year gains in reading and a whopping 50% of their school year gains in math. In other words, summer learning loss increases with age through elementary and middle school, a troubling trend that should be examined further. So it increases, the percentage increases with age. So I'm sorry, Those of you that are in college, (laughs) the percentage might be a lot higher than the 50% for math and 36% for reading. Which is why we always, we need to keep learning, right? One of the biggest um, killers of the elderly is sometimes retirement. Why? Because they stop working, they stop moving, they stop having Uh, a sense of purpose, and they start to fade. 
their minds start to fade, their bodies start to fade. God made us to keep learning, to keep developing, to keep getting stronger. And if we don't participate in that, then we'll never reach our full potential. So we have already covered like the body and how it's, it's, it just doesn't listen to you. I remember that this, there, there was an actress. I don't know if you guys ever seen the movie Tomb Raider, but she's like she's a she's she's a small woman of stature. She's maybe like five three, five four, and she trained for six months for to to get cut and lean, so so she could look like this action hero on the camera, right? And she said in an interview that she thought that she was going to be cut and strong for the rest of her life after what she was doing for the movie. After one week of not going to the gym and not eating the way she was, she was eating, all of the things, all of the, the, the physical evidence of her work was gone. And it's just not fair, right? We should be able to go to the gym once a week uh, once the beginning of the year, you know, when you do your New Year's resolution, go for that first week of the year and just be strong and buff the whole entire year and eat whatever you want the rest of the time. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, we constantly have to check in. Unfortunately, we have to consistently and every day dedicate ourselves to the betterment of our minds and our bodies. So what does this say about our spiritual life? How many times throughout the year do you need to check in spiritually? Is it a monthly basis? Is it a weekly basis? Is Sabbath the only time that's needed to stay spiritually strong? Or is it a daily commitment to exercising your mind to enforcing, reinforcing that connection, to reexamining that love relationship, strengthening your faith on a daily basis, so that when trial comes, spiritually, you look like Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Because if you don't, spiritually, you look like Pee Wee Herman. And when the challenges come, you won't be strong enough and you'll buckle. You'll lose your grip. Those of you that are in college, you guys know the strain is real. The struggle is real. But let me tell you something right now. The struggle never ends. I'm sorry, I meant to be, this was supposed to be an like inspirational speech, right? <laughs> but I, I'm trying to be, I, I try to be inspirational, but at the same time, be real, the struggle never ends. Congratulations on the job. It's going to have challenges. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to put pressures on your time. And young people today have to deal with a lot more pressure on their time than we do, than maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago because of an invention called the cell phone and the electronic email, the electronic mail. Oh, that's right, the E starts with electronic. <laughs> now your boss has access to you 24-7. If you're not checking your mail at 2 o'clock in the morning, you can get fired the next day. You know, in our, in our society today, working at a tech firm sounds great. The money sounds great. The opportunities sound great. And when you go there, on their floor, they have, you know, they have, uh, what, do you, what do you call the, the, I don't play it, so I, I can see it in my head. You know, when you do the ping pong ball and you, and you, and you hit smack it to each other, what's that called? Table tennis. There you go. Right there and, and, and they have little hammocks so you can take naps. Or they have cereal and they, have, and they order you food. And, and, and you're there and you never have to leave. They have inventions so that you could take a nap underneath your desk. Did you know that? They have hammocks that you can put underneath your desk 
so that you can nap underneath your desk? I'm sorry. If we look at, look at that situation maybe like 100 years ago, we would call that slavery. But today, it's called perks. The perks of the job. Yeah, I might put a hamster wheel in a cage for my hamster and give him food, but he ain't never leaving that cage. There's a huge demand on our youth today that is unprecedented. So what does that mean for your spiritual life? When it comes to working out, you got to stay to a schedule, right? You got to eat the right things. You got to go to the, to the gym at the right time. You got to exercise the right body part at the right time. Don't overwork it. You got to give it rest. You get whatever it's 24 hours or 48 hours of rest for each body month. I, I've read and if they all contradict each other. So whatever works for you, do it. But what does that mean for spiritual? You have to build a spiritual foundation to to have peace in this world. And you can't trip over God accidentally. You, you know what I mean by that? You can't go through your day doing all the other things that are on your priority list, and then if there's five minutes left over... Give that to God. Because I promise you that the devil will put something in your way to consume that five minutes. I recently got the new iPhone. And um, it has this app I'm not too happy about. It's an app that tracks how much time you spend on your phone. So not only does it tell you how much time that you spend on your phone, but it'll tell you how much time you spend on each app on your phone. If anybody still goes to Facebook, raise your hand. Snapchat. Uh, Instagram. Twitter, everything's becoming the same thing. It's like all the same, but like, but not. You guys understand the vortex of the black hole that is social media. And out of curiosity, I activated this application on my phone and I was not happy with the results. So I quickly turned it off. Because I didn't want to realize the truth was that the Bible app was open for maybe 15 minutes out of the week. But YouTube was open three hours a day. It's just an example, <laughs> by the way. It might have been much worse. Uh, anyway. So what does this say about our time? And how we structure it. We look at these magazines, right? And we look at the people who are on television. They're always giving their, their opinions on how to live life better. How to be successful or how to be, you know, pros at whatever you want to do. Musicians give tutorials on, on YouTube. So how do you can learn the right techniques for piano, for guitar, for violin, whatever it is that you want to learn. There's a website that you can go and probably learn it. But how do you learn about spiritual things? The only way you can learn about spiritual things is by cracking open that Bible. And one of the people that I really like in the Bible is Daniel. Because his situation is I can identify with. Not that I was, you know, held captive and taken away from my home and put into a strange land where they believe something different. And they try to change my name and try to force me to to believe as they do, but just the concept of being a follower of God in a land that doesn't believe like you do, that have different priorities, that have different beliefs, and 
who are constantly pressuring you to believe like they do, to think like they do. That's one of the things that the internet has really opened up, which is good, and also at the same time terrible. The ability to share ideas and the ability to shame people who are not following what you believe is it's an, it's an epidemic that's going on. When I used to go to elementary school, I used to get bullied at lunchtime, but it used to stop at lunchtime. It used to stop at 3 o'clock, and I used to be able to go home and not have to deal with the bully. But now the bully's on Facebook. The bully's on Twitter. And now adults are just as much as bullies. If you don't believe in the same political views or you don't believe in vaccinations or non-vaccinations or you know, outbreaks, ah, everybody's screaming at each other. So how do you keep your compass? And these turbulent waters. And I want to propose something. I want you guys to open Daniel 6, okay? Is it okay if we read from the Bible today? All right, cool. Say amen when you have it. Oh, nobody has it. So it's in the Old Testament. Okay. It's after Genesis, but it's before Revelations. Um, so I, I take this. Now, take this context, right, and put it into any situation, right? If you're a, a, you want to be uh, somebody who is influential in the industry of whatever, Okay, if you want to be the best social worker, if you want to be the best musician, right? But you have to deal with people who are not of the same frame of mind as you, who don't believe the way you believe, those who do not have the same sentiments about lying or cheating or, you know, doing anything you need to do to get where you want to be. It pleased Darius to a point. 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his ex exceptional qualities that the king plan to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charge against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could not find corruption in him because he was, un he was trustworthy and neither corrupt, corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, he, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went on to try to trap Daniel. So you guys know the story. You're familiar with the story, right? But I want to go towards the beginning. They could find no cause against him. He was not negligent in his duties. He was trustworthy. He was a, he said, he, he was, let's put this in, he was a slave. He was a captive of Israel brought in, stolen from his land by Nebuchadnezzar, distinguished himself amongst the, the Babylon University, right, where they're training him to be a wise man. He rejects their food, their way of eating, because, of, because their, their meats were dedicated to idols, and it was a form of worship to eat their meats. 
So he distinguished himself by saying, no, we'll do this instead. His friends would get into trouble because they wouldn't bow before the king. But that same king would declare that their God was God, the highest God in all the land, and demanded that all of his people would worship their God. So don't be afraid when somebody puts the fire on you, when somebody tries to to ensnare you. You stay faithful to God, and God will prop you up. So Daniel went through three different rulers, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, and now he's with Darius. And still he's on the top of his game. Not only is he main manager of all the employees underneath him, now the boss wants to give him the key to the store so that he is number two in the entire kingdom. Only to the king does he have to answer. The kingdom is essentially Daniel's. And because the the, the kingdom is Daniel's, it's also God's. Because God worked through Daniel to show Babylon who he is. It's a light that shines in the darkness. God says, you are the salt of the earth. Anybody cook? Anybody cook here? Salt. Does salt end up tasting like the things that you put on it? Or do the things that you put on it end up tasting like salt? Does salt ever lose its flavor? Does salt ever stop being salt? Does salt ever lose its identity? He said, no, I don't want to be salt today. I want to be garlic. No, it's still called garlic salt. If you find the ingredients in the day, it's still garlic salt. So it's still salty. Salt cannot be affected. When you put it in the pot and you cook whatever you're cooking in it, it makes everything savory and salty. Hopefully not. Don't put too much salt. But you get what I'm trying to say? You can be in the midst of Babylon and not be influenced, not be changed, not be converted to their idealisms if you stay salty. And how did Daniel get to be in this high position? Was it just talent? Was he because he was so smart and he was so, you know, he was just the, 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 the sumo cum laude 4.0 GPA, you know, the, the one with all the, the, the degrees and the smartest guy in the room. Was it because of that? Or was it because of his connection with God? So they couldn't find anything against him, against his work ethic or his trustworthiness. And they tried to hem him up by instituting this law that only Darius should be prayed to. They they appealed to Darius's ego. And they were like, you are God. We should only worship you. And anybody else that doesn't worship you and pray to you, they should be thrown in the lion's den. This is all for you, by the way. We have nothing to gain from this. Suck-ups. You're going to have to deal with a lot of those. (laughs) Daniel learning, learned that the decree had been published. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Did he do this because of the the law? 
Or was he already just doing this? He had already been doing this. Checking in with the big man upstairs three times a day, morning, noon, and night. Like you need to eat, you need to pray. Because really, going back to the whole fitness and the whole learn, losing your, your knowledge base over a, a span of summer, we are very fickle. We're a fickle people. That's why in the Bible we're referred to as lambs. And I'm sorry, lambs are kind of dumb. Oh, they never look up. They're always munching on grass. And they're only following the path of the green grass. So as long as there's green grass in front of them, they're going to keep on stepping away from the flock. They'll keep on stepping away from the shepherd. And it's the shepherd that has to go and collect the lamb and bring it back to the fold. He can't guard himself from the wolves. Only the shepherd can. The lamb is the most defenseless, defenseless animal that you can find to be identified as. And yet God calls us lambs. We forget. We might be inspired by a song on Sabbath morning. We might be inspired by a story by the pastor on Sabbath morning. Take their Sabbath nap and forget half the sermon. By Sunday, forget about it. We're thinking about all the things we need to do that week. We're trying to get the to-do list together. We go back to worrying about the things we were worrying about before Sabbath came. And the things that inspired you and the things that you held to on Sabbath morning start to fade away every second that you're away from me. Speaking from experience. And the longer you're away from your Bible or from praying, the less you start to believe in God's goodness and God's blessings. And believe it or not, you even start to forget that God loves you. You even start to forget that you're not alone. And then you go into your week trying to pound out these challenges. And you're trying to solve everything on your, on your, on your own. And you're, and you're stressing over this not going the way you want it to be. And that person giving you, you know, the side eye and, and the silent uh, treatment and get stressed. What if you could be a happy Christian? What if on a daily basis you can feel the love of God in your heart? You could be at peace. You can have confidence. Because you know whom you serve. And you know who has your back. And you know who's been supporting you this whole time. Sabbaths are great to get together with people that think like you and, and they believe in the same things. And you can sing together and your voices join and your prayers join. And you feel so revived and you feel you get on the spiritual high. But it won't last all week. It's used, you go to sleep and it's almost gone the next day. If you cut a fruit from its tree, the very second that it's plucked from the tree, it starts to deteriorate. It starts to rot. And God describes his son Jesus as being the vine. And we are the branches that shoot from that vine. And then we bear fruit. But a branch that is not connected to the vine will never bear fruit. It will wither. It will dry up. And it will be ready to be burned. It's amazing, right? 
Let's open up Matthew 6.33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek. That's an active word. That's a word of action. That means you go out and you look for it. You go, you go searching and you don't stop until you find it. First, establishes a priority. That God is number one in your life. That he's the first person that you check in with. I stopped putting my cell phone by the bed because I found that the first thing I did was I turned on my cell phone. And I gave myself a challenge for one month that for, for the first 15 minutes of the day, I would not be on my cell phone and I would try to open up my Bible and pray. And it made a difference. It made a difference in my grumpiness. It made me feel more optimistic. It made me feel more secure in myself. It made me understand that God is with me and that God is listening to all the words I'm saying. So I was more careful with the way I spoke to people. It changes your outlook. You got to schedule your time like like you do a budget. Anybody budget here? Anybody budget their money? Raise your hand if you budget your money. I'm starting to get worried. Okay? Those of you that budget, you know when you don't budget, your money disappears and you have no idea where it went. You're given 1,440 minutes a day. You got to budget that time. If you budget that time and you could account for every single minute of that day, you'll be assured that minutes won't just go disappearing. And that you could actually do something with that time that you can't get back. It runs out. And then you're giving another 1,440 minutes to work with. Put eight hours for sleep. College students are like, what? Eight hours? (laughs) What's that? Eight hours for work. Even if you do eight hours of work and eight hours of sleep, you still have how many hours? Wow. Okay. Any math majors? Anybody going to be a math teacher? (laughs) It's eight. Yes. You still have eight hours. So you have eight hours of free time. Well, free-ish time, right? Eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, and then eight hours to do the traveling, to do the food shopping, to do, you know, hang out with some friends. To, but where was my first mistake? Huh? I started with giving eight hours to the job, eight hours to sleep. And then I started talking about the driving and the shopping and the friends. And I was almost tempted to go all the way down to the last hour of the day, then decide how much I was going to give to God. What if we do it the opposite way? You do with your time what you do with your money. Tithe it, right? Before you do anything, you should be taking 10% out of your, out of your, out of your pocket, dedicating that to God. Before you do anything in your day, you should be taking out time to dedicate to God. And I promise you, it will not return to you void. It will not be in vain. Your capacity for learning, for attaining knowledge, for attaining wisdom, for taking on the world, for taking on pressures and and the distractions of the world will be increased. God will bless it. Open up to my my second favorite 316, which is 2 Timothy 316. And 2 Timothy Timothy 316 says this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness 
so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's make this more inclusive. So that every woman, man, child, elder will be equipped to do the good work. We have everything that we need right here. And we have the time. Believe me, we have the time. I used to teach 5 through 10 Bible, and every time I would ask them, so how much time did you, did you pray today? And they were like, none, I don't have time. I got homework and I have this. I'm like, you, you guys tell me about Fortnite like every single day. You guys have time to dedicate 15 minutes or, you know, in the morning and at night to at least check in with God, pray, and read some scripture. God is good. And all the time. But we tend to forget that. The longer we're away from God, we tend to forget that. So check in with God. Read scripture prayerfully. Get together and read scripture. Call each other in the morning. Hey, social media is good for more than one thing than ranking on your friends for not, you know, doing the right thing. You know, you can do Bible studies on social media. You can call each other in the morning. But hey, let's pray together. Yeah, yeah, I, I picked your name out of the hat. I got to pray with you today. So what do you, what do you need? Amen. Okay. Support each other. That's one of the reasons that we have a church. It's a community that's supposed to support and encourage each other to pursue the things of God. We have enough people criticizing us and judging us. We need more encouragement and sound wisdom to be whispered in our ears. And you might be asking me, well, how do I pray? Jesus gives a perfect demonstration on how. If you open up to Luke 11, 2 to 4, or Matthew 9, I mean Matthew 6, 9 to 13, we all know it by the Lord's Prayer. How many of you know it by heart? All right, I'm going I'm to attempt, because I know it from the song, so I tend to sing it, but our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forget, forgive our debtors. And, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Study that and you'll know how to pray on a daily basis. First, it identifies God as the true God, the most glorious God, worthy of praise and, and, and elevation in, in the highest. He establishes his authority over your life. And then it goes into telling you not to worry about tomorrow. Give us this day our daily bread. Because today's troubles are sufficient, right? And teaching us to be as gracious to others as he is gracious to us. Forgiving them as we seek to be forgiven. And knowing that this world is a world full of temptations. And we're going we're gonna to be facing those minute by minute, hour by hour. And we're asking him to just keep us from that. Get us through that. And then once again, ending, knowing that this earth, that this church, that that bench and that grass and that sky and those clouds are all gods. The money, the banks, the, the, the country, it's all gods. And he has control. The job, it's all gods. And he has control. But I want to end with a little laughter. And I always like the skit guys, so I want to show you guys this video on the skinny of prayer, okay?
my prayer life is vibrant and it's active daily. I like to commune with God at nighttime. I get under those warm covers and I kiss my wife goodnight and I just start talking to God, just me and God, tell him everything. <sighs> Makes me just sleepy just thinking about it. And there I am just laying in bed, laying out my request to him and he's hearing me. And I know that I'm in good company with him. Where was I? The efficiency of one's prayers are directly congruent to the position of one's body. Therefore, the legs should be saying, God, help me. Amen. There are times that me and God do not talk, and that is not God's fault, that is mine. I just get so busy. And so when I do end up talking to God, I really just try to impress him, give him a show, just to show him how much I love him. So excuse me, will you, as I pray to God. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh, Heavenly Father, beseech me not unto thee, how now? Brown cow, oh, thy soul is so dry, and if I can just catch a morsel of who you are, so verily, merrily, down the stream. God, I, I just want to be used by you, God. I want, I want to be salt and light and light and salt and sight and love and... Peppers and oregano and pepperoni and black olives and those little bit. When I like to get my prayer on, uh, there's some things I keep in mind. Um, I think it's totally awesome that uh, God is like Santa Claus, and he wants to give you the things that you want. Therefore, you need to keep lists of things. My list currently has 745 prayer requests on them. So then when I go to the Lord in prayer, it looks a little something like this. I'll just pray real quick. Um, let's see. The uno thing on my list is my mom. And so I'll pray for her now. Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up this sweet salt of the earth lady that you have blessed me with to be my mother. And I tell you thank you. And although I know that I'm called to respect her and I give her all due respect, there's also an issue of something she truly needs, and that is to stop a yapping. Lord, she yaps. And she doesn't know how to stop yapping. So could you please make her mute just for a day? Nothing permanent. Don't hurt her. I love her. Just mute her. Take your big God remote and push mute on her channel. That would be great. Henceforth, I would go on and pray all 746 things. God, you are greater than anything this world has to offer. And I can't wait for you to come back and get us. But until that time comes, would you help me just to, just to live my life day after day as if I'm just walking hand in hand with you? God, I, I have a lot of needs. And I have a lot of wants. And sometimes I get those things confused. Help me to just trust you to meet my needs. And be thankful when you give me those other things that I just want. God, I have blown it so many times today, and I'm sorry. Thank you for your forgiveness. I don't take it for granted. And God, as I start this day out, I, I'm just reminded that this world is filled with so many spiritual potholes. Please help me to walk in such a way where I won't stumble so much. And as I'm going through this day, God, Help me to live my life in such a way that would bring you glory and honor. May the life that I live be a life of worship to you. Amen. So I want to thank you guys again for inviting me, and I hope um, I learned a lot this week. Because... Um, I don't want to go any longer, but I've been looking for, for work for like the past month. And usually the job or the school provides the structure, the schedule. 
you know what you got to do throughout your day on, on your day. But when you're on your own, you know how it is during the summer. If you're not t- if you're not working, if you're not studying, you know what happens. You start waking up at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and you know night is day, day is night, and you know your whole your whole clock is all messed up, and you spend you spend so much time on Netflix. They ask you, "Are you still watching?" So it's a, it's a blessing to be able to 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 rediscover that we need to put ourselves in check that we need to structure our time and that most importantly that we need to structure time for God if anybody has ever some of you are married. Some of you might have boyfriends or girlfriends. You want, want to keep them? You want to keep them? You continue dating. You call. You communicate. You, share, you spend time together. And, you never, and you never, it's never a burden because you love them and you want to be with them. And in that same way, that's the way it should be with God. You check in, you communicate, you share time together, you learn about each other more and more. And that love only deepens, it gets stronger. And once you start neglecting those things in a, in a relationship, it starts to fade away. And then you forget why you're in love. You forget why you're together. So in love, it's very important to stay connected, to communicate. Remember when you first believed. There's nothing sadder than seeing somebody who is newly baptized that has that fire, you know, that has that excitement because they, they're just so happy that God loves them and that they are forgiven, that, they, that God sees them as being pure and righteous because his son died for them and has washed away all their sins with his blood, and then slowly see them go from excited to bench warming. We need to be active. I love seeing the young people in this church working in the church. Because you guys, you make the older people feel young. And you bring life to the church. And the elders of the church bring the wisdom and the experience. So it's a partnership to build a community that helps each other grow and learn. The church can be a beautiful place. If we learn how to nurture each other, to be compassionate, to be empathetic, to not scorn each other for our errors or our sins, but to encourage each other to lift up our eyes to Jesus who smiles upon you every day. So I ask you today, my second request, can you find some time in your schedule for God on a daily basis? You might want to start out small. Starting out small is better than starting at all. But at least at the end of the week, you won't say to yourself, where did the time go? And hopefully that when you're in the last days of your life, you won't be saying the, the, the two words that are the most regretful, sorrowful words that you could say. And that's if only. Spend every minute of your day wisely. God bless you guys. Um, You want to stand and and we'll pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you again for being who you are for loving us at our lowest, for being patient with us when we're infuriated, for never leaving our side and for always recorrecting, rerouting our routes back to you when we deviate, Lord. 
Thank you for being compassionate. And thank you for sacrificing everything you have so that we can be together. Please help us to remember those things on a daily basis, to remind ourselves through prayer and reading of your word so that this relationship between us can get stronger. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.